Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mari Carmen, for inviting me uh, to speak and to Chispa and for everybody to come, uh, for coming out. Uh, it's uh, an interesting thing to be talking about, um, and I'm going to kind of address at the very beginning some of the reasons or at least the first feelings that I had that made me feel like maybe I wasn't the person to speak at this kind of event. Um, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, right? So we're trying to think about Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month and what it means to be Hispanic and to have and celebrate Hispanic heritage. Uh, Mari Carmen said, would you do this? And I thought, well, actually, the first thing that came to mind was an anecdote that I'm going to start my remarks with. And I think some of the, the weirdness of the anecdote will get us uh, on the right footing to think about the questions that we're going to talk about. Um, as Mari Carmen said, I did my PhD at the University of Virginia. I was there for many years. Uh, while I was there, I got to know the Rare Book School, which is an independent inst institute that's housed at UVA. It's not part of UVA. It's housed there. Every summer they run classes mostly for librarians, for conservators, people that work with old books, rare manuscripts, uh, things that need to be kept safely, things that need to be interpreted um, and that need to be repaired, um, worked on, things like that. So I got to know that institute and I worked there for three summers, the past three summers. This past summer I was there working and I had my name tag. Uh, since I was at UVA for so long, I knew a lot of people. One of the people that I knew very well at UVA was the Romance, li uh, Romance Languages librarian named Miguel Valladares at the University of Virginia. And so one day I get in the elevator to go up and down and do some of my work at Rare Book School, and I have my name tag on there. And it said Rare Book School and University of Virginia, and it said Zach Ludington. And I got in the elevator, and this woman gets in the elevator right behind me, and she looks at my name tag, and she says in English, ah, oh, Miguel was looking for you. And I said, Miguel Valladares? And she said, ¿Tú eres hispano? And the door opened and she got off. And she said, Tengo que irme. And I was like, what a, what a question, right? ¿Tú eres hispano? Where'd that come from? Where'd the switch in language come from? That she switched to Spanish, assumed I spoke Spanish, and wanted to know if I was Hispanic because of the way I said Miguel Valladares? Because I knew Miguel and only Hispanic people know Miguel? Maybe I wasn't really sure and I didn't answer. I kind of stood there, uh, dot, dot, dot was my reply. You know, that's all I could come up with. Partly because I didn't know how to respond, but also because I didn't know what her question really was, what it was meant to ask. I mean, the short answer is no, I'm not Hispanic because my parents don't speak Spanish, my family doesn't have a historical connection to the Hispanic world. In the 21st century in the United States, when we say someone's Hispanic, we understand a series of possible connections through family, cultural history, things like that. Connections that my family doesn't share. When we say Hispanic in the 21st century in the United States, we mean somebody who belongs to histories of minority status. And that's not my family, and that's not me. But it's still a weird question, and the circumstances of it coming up felt kind of weird. When we usually talk about somebody who's Hispanic, we often kind of try to define that through genetic, biological connections. We often think in geographic terms, and we often think of something connected to a language or a culture of origin. Origins, are you Hispanic? What are your origins, right? Well, I stood there. And I didn't, you know, what do I say to this? And as I said, my answer is no. But I paused. And my pause could be represented with puntos suspensivos, the title of my talk. The Diccionario de la Real Academia Española defines that orthographical sign as a signo ortográfico usado para señalar la interrupción de un discurso para darlo por conocido o sobreentendido para indicar vacilación o para sugerir un final abierto which in English we could say is a punctuation sign, used to signal the interruption of a discourse, you know, it's cut off, dot, 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 to indicate that its meaning is known or understood, as in, you know, dot, 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 or to indicate vacillation, to suggest an open ending. I think my dot, dot, dot kind of encompassed all those, right? Because it wasn't appropriate for me to say yes, of course, and yet my life is so closely aligned with the Spanish language and with cultures aligned with the Spanish language, my professional life, my personal life, everything. And so in some ways, it feels like I am connected to that, right? But as I said, we usually understand those connections to be biological, genetic, geographical, 
and at some level deeply and distantly in the past uh, cultural. And they're all questions of origin, which is why maybe it's not surprising that on the United States Census, the last census of 2010, the question about Hispanic origin was worded thusly. It said, uh, please answer both question five about Hispanic origin and question six about race. So Hispanic origin is not the same as race, but Hispanic origin is your origin, right? The question is, is this person, because one person can fill out census for all their family members, is this person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? No, not of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. Yes, Mexican, Mexican American, Chicano. Yes, Puerto Rican. Yes, Cuban. Yes, another Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. And print the name, please. What is origin? The word's all over it, right? What does it mean to have an origin in Nicaragua? As I said, usually we think of genetic, geographical, and cultural terms, but we often conflate those three. We often make them equivalent. And I think if we think hard about it, we'll realize that they're not equivalent and that often maybe we shouldn't conflate those three. The census defines origin this way. So Hispanic or Latino refers to a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South Central, South or Central American, or other Spanish. Those are all Spanish? What? It's a little weird, right? Or other Spanish culture or origin, regardless of base. Again, origin, right? As I said, we often conflate them. Uh, we often imagine that ge geography and genetics might or could be the same thing, or that culture could be the same thing, or that if you know the geography, you can guess at the family, or that you can guess at the geography. Anyone ever heard of Residente? Maybe you have, but under a different name. This is the front man from Calle Trece, the Puerto Rican rap-ish rap group. Well, he's got a solo project now. This is his album that uh, came out recently. He had nine nominations to the Latin Grammys from this album. Pretty big deal. And this is the concept of the album. He took a DNA test, which would show him geographic origins, right, for his ancestors. And it came back with 10 different locations around the globe uh, to which his DNA was linked in some way. In Ghana, Siberia, China, the Caribbean, indigenous peoples, right? And so for the album, he traveled around the world and he met with local musicians in these different places and recorded tracks with them. So he recorded in Ghana, he recorded in Siberia, he recorded in China, he reported, recorded all over the place, right? In that project, we see kind of that conflation of geography with origin. It makes sense to be curious about your roots. It makes sense to be excited to know that your DNA can be linked to distant peoples, distant in time and space, all around the world. It makes sense to be curious about what kind of culture could also be associated with those places and with those genetic origins. But if we think about, his real name is René Pérez, if we think about René Pérez going to Siberia and sitting down with Siberian musicians and making music, I think it would be a little bit anachronistic, a little bit unfair and strange to say that he went there because he had Russian ancestors, right? Or that he went to Ghana and played music with Ghanaian musicians because he had Ghanaian ancestors, right? I mean, what does it mean to be Russian? Who knows when his ancestors came from what is now part of Russia, right? Russia is a category, just like Hispanic, that is in flux, right? That can change. Um, Things like Russia and Ghana, they're historical categories, and they have physical boundaries, and they have social boundaries, and those boundaries are changing all the time. Uh, so when we think about what Hispanic means, I think we need to try to think in historical terms too, and how, just as we see in the case of this guy, the word can branch out to a bunch of different places and different moments and different ideas. Right? So for example, if we think about where the word itself just comes from, Hispanic, from Hispania, España, right? they're cognates. But even the story at its very beginning is really mixed up. Here we've got a map of Roman expansion into the Iberian Peninsula. When the Romans got to the Iberian Peninsula, they started conquering in the red, you see up at the top, it's 220 BC. So the red is the first areas of Roman control. And then that control expands across the peninsula all the way to 27 AD, which is when pretty much total control of the peninsula is Roman. 
Throughout that time, the boundaries of different provinces, Roman provinces, shifted. But they are always called Hispania Betica, Hispania Ulterior, Hispania Citerior, and stuff like that. Hispania. Well, where's that word come from? It's not known. It could come from Hispan, a legendary uh, king, son of a king, warrior, something, but it's not very clear. Hispalis, which is a city now in Andalusia, close to Sevilla, um, which might have its origin in Hispan, one of these legendary wars. It might come from a Phoenician word, which means island where they do a lot of metal smelting. It also might come from a different Phoenician word, which means island where there are a lot of hyraxes, which are like rabbits but aren't rabbits. <laughs> right? But nobody knows where it comes from. And it wasn't always the whole peninsula. It was just a little sliver in what's now Catalonia, which might not become might not be part of Spain, right? So this, the categories associated with that word, the geographical, the political, the human social categories, right, have been shifting ever since the word was first established um, to refer to any kind of geographical area, right? Um, we can see that that continues forever. I've got a list of all these names of different peoples, right? When the Romans came, there were people living on the Iberian Peninsula already. People like Celts. What does that mean, though, right? That was a category that itself was certainly shifting, if it existed at all in the time that the people that we call Celts were living. And Iberians, another one, right? And then the Goths and the Visigoths, which were not so uniform as we imagined, right? Invaded the peninsula toward the end of Roman hegemony. And then after that, you had Moors from North Africa, and, well, were they, were they really from North Africa? Or, you know, what's an origin? Because that's the Islamic ex expansion across North Africa. You have people moving around all the time forever, and that's been the history of, of humankind. And you have the categories under which they live, geographical and social, also shifting all the time. Right? That's before we even get to the imperial world. Right? We're talking about all kinds of different categories that we can't consider stable. We're talking about people moving around all over the place. Long before we even live in a world that we consider more or less globalized with real, fast, and big expansion. This is a map from 1529 made by a guy named Diego Ribeiro, also sometimes called Diogo Ribeiro. Right? He has a Portuguese version of his name and a Spanish version of his name. It's really interesting because you see how even though this is not the best image, this is the one I could get that had enough resolution to blow it up big. Right? You can see that already in 1529, we've got a really clear outline of the east coast of the Americas. Right? And we've got an excellent rendering of the old world. But, if you can see, this west coast of South America is all blank. It's unknown. The categories of where people are, where they're from, and how they live and how they cross the world are being formed at this time. And they'll continue to be formed throughout our modern history. This is a map that shows all the different places to which the Spanish Empire laid claim. And so you might imagine that this is the Hispanic world. The geography of what counts as Hispanic. The geography is what's known to the Spanish crown has been shifting continually forever. So when we think, okay, my ancestors are from this place. What is that place? That place is not a stable category. It's not something that is assigned a, a cultural identity that doesn't change. Those cultural identities themselves change. The names that we apply to people, the places, they're all shifting constantly. Right? Which is why a sociologist at Berkeley named Cristina Mora, she kind of got into this she said, well, in, knowing this history, this complicated history of imperialism, of the category shifting, the word itself not having a known etymology, said, what do we call Hispanic people in the United States? The census says, what's your origin? But identifying an origin can be very complicated. If you go in genetic terms, like Residente, you find that many people in what we now call the Hispanic world have ancestors who came from all over. Right? We find that the geographical area that we understand to be the Hispanic world is not a stable set of places. We find that in relatively recent history, in fact, 
the actual outlines of the land masses is new knowledge. Remember, the Phoenicians thought that Iberia might be an island where they did a lot of metallurgy. Rivero, in 1529, couldn't guess as to what the whole western coast of the Americas was. So even the physical land masses were up for debate for a long, long time. So Cristina uh, Mora, she goes about just figuring out what this category is and how it comes about. Um, her book's from 2014. It's called Making Hispanics, How Activists, Bureaucrats, and Media Constructed a New American. And uh, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, she reminds us that categories emerge not from one particular source, but rather from the interactive relationships between sets of actors. In the case of Hispanic as a term on the census and really as a term in public discourse in the United States, it's a product of a kind of a weird team effort between Univision, the Nixon administration, and mostly Mexican-American activist groups starting in the 60s. With the big influx of Cubans and a lot of Puerto Ricans coming to the United States, uh, Mexican-American activist groups who fought for workers' rights and things like that saw an opportunity to connect with other people who spoke Spanish and were in the United States. Now, often the kind of things that those Mexican-American activist groups were hoping for were quite different from the political concerns of Cubans and Puerto Ricans. But they still thought, well, maybe we can kind of get on board with the same people. At the same time, Univision was a relatively, it wasn't called that, it had a different name then. It was looking for an audience, right? And so the activist groups and Univision teamed up to help each other find people, essentially. And they also teamed up with the Nixon administration Census Bureau so that they could find people. And they all had mutual interest in finding and identifying people. And how did they come to call them? It was organic and kind of indirect. But over time, the term Hispanic arose. It's a relatively recent invention in the United States. I know, Sandra, just the other day, you said, I didn't become Hispanic until I came to the US. I was Colombian before that. Right. Uh, well, that has a history, right? It has a history in the United States, which is a very strong history. It also has a history around the world, right? So, as we see just with that history about Cubans and Puerto Ricans, we know that people have always moved around a lot. And we've seen from the larger history that those categories of where people live and where they're from are very, very unstable. Nonetheless, I think it's natural. Was it? That was given to me. In Washington, when there was declaration of officially the Hispanic Month. When it was de exactly, when Hispanic Heritage Month was created, in right? The United States. Well, it's created in 2005 because, well, we have a Hispanic heritage now. We've got 50 years of the term. So what does it mean? It's natural that we have things like Hispanic Heritage Month. It's natural that people like Rene Perez are curious about their origins, especially given the fact that people have always moved about. And thus, you don't know where your origins lie. You don't know in the Americas after, with a history of slavery, right? You don't know where your ancestors came from. There are no records of those things. So I too am curious, right? Everyone is. We're gonna think about some stuff that I've managed to learn about my origins, um, such as they are. In the usual terms that we imagine origins to be determined genetically, geographically, culturally, right? And try to answer the question of how did I become professor of Spanish in this world in which we're honoring Hispanic Heritage Month, which is itself a relatively recent and unstable and flexible and weird category. Right? <laughs> it just so happens that, like Rene Perez, I got to know some about my DNA and also about my genealogy. When I was about uh, 15 or so, my dad got a phone call, I think, if I remember right. Maybe it was an email when email was a different beast. Uh, from a guy named Ron Luddington. And he was a guy that said, look, I retired some years ago and I spent my retirement doing genealogical research and I found you. I'm so glad I found you. Now I can give you all the information that I have about the Luddington family, right? And it was fascinating stuff. And he had traced all the Luddington um, generations back to Northern England in the early 16th century. And he had us mapped out birth dates, death dates, places of birth, death, everything. 16 generations, pretty amazing. Luckily, Luddington is a relatively uncommon name, so he was able to do that. You know, he would go to public records in, in the US and Canada and England, he would find people's names, and it's not Smith, so you can actually figure it out. Right? It's fascinating, right? 
And so this is the place where my name comes from. It's Luddington in northern England, right? But this is two Ds. In England, it's usually two Ds. And I've got one D, right? You go, wow, that's pretty cool. This is where I'm from, right? This is my origin, right? That's what it feels like. That's what it ought to be. I mean, Luddington, all my generations back, right? There it is on the map. Well, right? And the thing is, the other names in that family history, the names of the wives of all the Luddington men back and back and back, were usually English names too. Whitehead, Nickel, Fisher. Okay, I'm English, right? Well, I've been to England and I'm not English. Right? I've talked to plenty of English people. I'm not English. Right? So, you're, okay, well, the way I am is, is different from being English, but aren't my origins English? That's where my name's from. That's where my family history is. Aren't my genetics English? It should line up because we imagine those three things line up, but they really very rarely do, right, in real terms. Plus, whatever distance pack we're talking about, England didn't exist, so forget it. Well, let me tell you about the name Luddington and where it comes from. That might help us to think through some of this stuff. Uh, well, actually, yeah, let's look at the map first, and we'll talk about Luddington. So because we have all this gene genealogical information, it's really cool. You can see kind of the the movement of the Luddingtons through time and space. Um, my ancestor, I had this all typed up. I don't have a f digital file of it. I had it all typed up, birth dates, death dates, places, names, everything. I don't know where it is. I just moved here, so it's like somewhere. I looked for it. But I do remember that in 1637, my ancestor, William Luddington, arrived in East Haven, Connecticut. And in uh, Putnam County, New York, um, there's a place, there's a road called Luddingtonville Road. There used to be a town called Luddingtonville, and that's where some of my ancestors lived, including my um, relatives, not ancestors. Sybil Luddington was a Revolutionary War figure and her father, Colonel Henry Luddington. My ancestor was Henry's brother, forget his name, had it written down, don't know where it is. Right? So you can already see the family kind of moving west. There's a place in Michigan called Luddington, Michigan. Somehow my family's connected to that. I say my family. Jeremy. I've never been there. Then there was a governor of Wisconsin in the late 19th century named Luddington. Then my grandfather was born in Scobie, Montana, which is just next to Luddington, Montana. He's Luddington too. And my father was born in Eugene, Oregon. So that's a, it's an interesting map because you kind of have the westward expansion of the United States with the westward expansion of the Luddington name. You go, okay, very cool, right? So that's the recent history. And you can see how it goes back. So it all lines up. We see the movement. We know what one generation does and where it lived and where it was born and how it moves back all the way to England. So right, we're English? Well, let's think about it. So the name Luddington, just like Washington or, or any of the other Ing-ton names, is a patronymic. It's got an element in the middle, Ing, which is the possessive, and ton, which is like town and enclosed space. So Luddington means Luda's farm. And Luda is an old English name appearing in variants such as Luth or MacLeod, like the, Liad, the loud Liad part. That's essentially the same thing, I guess. Uh, MacLeod, son of Luda. It's from the old Scandinavian personal name, Lealter, I guess it is. This I got from the Oxford Dictionary of Family Names in Britain and Ireland. So it makes sense, right? You've got Luddington. It's this place in England. There's a guy named Luda. He's an old Viking. He goes there, he conquers it, he sets it up. Right? And that name survives as the place where his family lives. And then his descendants are from there. In fact, my ancestors, we can trace them back, Luddington, to 1514, right in that spot. But the name Luddington was already registered in the Doomsday Book in 1086. So yeah, it's an old Scandinavian name and that's the spot, right? So I'm a descendant of this Luda, somebody, right? It's tempting. It almost makes you want to go back and record music with those guys, right? La Residente. It makes you want to think, these are my origins. This is where I'm from. But I'll tell you something. This personal name, Lyotr, guess what it means? Ugly. <laughs> and I'm too beautiful to be descended from a guy named Ugly. Right? So as I said, we're going to think about genetics, too. My older brother. Maybe you've heard of 23andMe, right? It's a service that does genetic testing, and they tell you 
certain markers, right? They used to tell you a lot more, but they got into legal trouble and they had to scale back the kind of stuff they, they told you. My older brother did it when it was a brand new thing. And one of the pieces of information they gave him was his Y chromosome haplogroup. So the, Robert could tell you more about this. He's a professor of biology. But on the Y chromosome in men, you have genes that don't change from generation to generation because they don't undergo recombination, right? When you get new, uh, new uh, sperm and eggs formed, right? And so when geneticists trace populations, they often use men because they can go right, right to the Y chromosome haplogroup and they can tell which parent it came from and trace back. Because if you take something from the X or from some other chromosome, it could be from mother and father. It's much more expensive to find out which one it comes from. Right? So they often use this set of genes on the Y chromosome. My Y chromosome haplogroup is T1, also called TM184. And it's extremely rare in Britain and Northern Europe. In fact, it only has dense concentrations in the Horn of Africa and in the Indian subcontinent. Right? So, it means I really probably am not directly descended from a Viking guy named Luda. Right? <laughs> I am not Ugly's son. <laughs> More likely, whoever my, you know, as far back as we could go, my direct male ancestor on the male line, father's, 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 father, comes from Mediterranean basin somewhere, right? At some time. And as we've already seen, the way people move about is crazy, and it always has been for a long, long time. We don't have geographic origins. Our genes don't line up with a geography that we can imagine. These things aren't stable. And even if we could gather some information on an individual basis, whoops, even if I was sure where my T haplogroup came from and can trace it back, we'd be talking about just that guy, only that guy. And all those other people also contributed to my genetic makeup. Right? Genes are not a very good thing to go by to establish identity. That's not really how it works. So I'm not English. OK. That's fine. And, you know, what am I? Right. And how did I get here? Um, again, you know that question, are you Hispanic? I kind of said no. I said the answer is no, because whatever my family history is and whatever my own personal derivation from that history is, it's complicated, it's mixed up, but it doesn't align with the relatively recent category that we have in the United States of Hispanic. Right. So I'm still kind of paused. I'm still kind of doubting. That label Hispanic is attached to certain human histories, you know, I can't claim. Uh, it means specific and often ambiguous things in the 21st century in the US. Uh, maybe many of you have received this next question. When you can't answer affirmatively yes or no, or maybe when you do answer no, the next question might be, what are you? Right? Which is like, OK. The answer to that often is another set of puntos suspensivos. What's, where's that question coming from? What are you getting at with that question? Is that an aggressive question? Right? Is there any way to answer it? Well, I certainly don't think we ought to answer it with a single word. Um, I don't, don't think it's a very helpful or very interesting question because it's asking for a summary, right? It's asking for everything to be pinpointed and for everything to line up, for whatever we imagine our origins to be both geographical, uh, well, at three times, geographical, genetic, and cultural, and for all that to be stable and the same. But we know that that's just not how things work. Um, we know that even in the United States, the, kind, the ways that we define ourselves and the ways that we define our composition as a population are changing rapidly. Right? This is also from the Census Bureau. More than half of the growth in the total population in the United States between 2000 and 2010 was due to the increase in the Hispanic population, as in the people that mark Hispanic. Whatever that means, it can mean lots of things. It does mean lots of things. The Hispanic population increased by 15.2 million between 2000 and 2010, accounting for over half of the 27.3 million increase in the total population of the United States. Pretty tremendous. So even if I can't answer affirmatively, yes, I'm Hispanic, then no, I'm not, sure. Together, collectively, we certainly are in the United States increasingly 
more Hispanic. And that's a fact. And that's really the reason that Spanish was offered in my middle school, which is why I took Spanish. It was automatic. I didn't take Japanese because that wasn't there and I wasn't interested. And I, I took Spanish as a middle school student because, I don't know, I wasn't really making decisions back then. Right? And then I continued with it. And because of this huge increase and this general paradigm in the United States, there was a strong and robust study abroad program at my undergraduate university, University of North Carolina. And so I went and I studied abroad in Spain. And I had so many credits that I was going to do a Spanish major, major anyway. And I loved literature, and I was interested in Spanish, and I was doing well, and so I continued. Essentially, so much of it was decided for me by the demographic shifts, by the just general place we were at in the country. Um, you know, also, yeah, a degree in Spanish was easy to arrange because of those things, but it also felt natural and worthwhile uh, in the United States because I didn't know what the hell I was going to do when I graduated. I had a double major in Romance Languages and in Journalism. Right? And so then, when I was getting ready to graduate, I had to figure out what I was going to do. And since I had a major in Spanish and I liked reading and talking about literature, I thought maybe I can do what my professors do. And I talked to them about pursuing graduate work, and that's what I did, and here I am. So maybe you could say that this is the factor that determined me pursuing this profession. So the census information, as I said, doesn't just show us that there are more Hispanics among us. I think that's, if we can identify a number, that's the least helpful thing. You say, these are the Hispanic people. What it shows us is that the United States is ever more Hispanic. But it always has been. As much as it's ever been constituted as the United States, it's had a strong Hispanic history, even if we didn't have that census term. 500 years ago, right? So I think a celebration of Hispanic heritage is a chance for us to bring attention to that fact, into that really complicated history. I think it's a chance for us not to answer those questions with a single word, yes or no, but to give things a little bit of time, a little bit of pause, and to consider how complicated any response that we offer is gonna be. Uh, it's also a chance to remember that names like Ludington, as we saw, and Washington are written all over this country, often to the exclusion and to the detriment of other names, right? names that we assume to be Hispanic. Uh, I think that should give us pause, right? So when we do think about how we're gonna celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, I think it shouldn't be simply by saying, these are the facts, these are the Hispanic people in the United States, and this is what they do. But rather recognizing that collectively, we're all continually more Hispanic, and that there's much more to learn than just a simple answer about what origins uh, we have or share or don't share. I think curiosity has got to be a part of it. So I'm confident in saying that a celebration of Hispanic heritage should be all about that, curiosity and uh, difference and finding out things that surprise you. I think it should be about raising questions rather than demanding a single simple answer. And I think you could say the story of Hispanic heritage and the story of the heritage of my name and DNA are parallel stories because it feels like that, right? Imperial colonial history, the English colonies, Spanish colonies, and so they're parallel histories. But in a lot of ways, it doesn't make sense to talk about parallelisms when you've got lines that are so twisted, that are so curvy and weird, and that obviously crisscross one another over and over again. So I think we all share in that kind of wild story, and it's never a straight trajectory. Uh, we all share in the story of colonialism and cultural exchange and globalization and human migration with all the wonders and all the horrors that are attendant on that history. So I think the more that you think about any of those ostensibly stable categories, and then you think of those ca categories next to the history, you find that the product of those categories is never really stable, but rather fleeting. It doesn't mean they're not useful categories or meaningful, both per personally and collectively, but it's because we have the standard ideas and accepted terms that we're able to question them that we're able to put our curiosity in motion and find out, maybe never really, but at least try to find out what really happened and what's really going on. That way we're, allowed to, we're able to allow ourselves to be surprised, to be caught off guard, to imagine disparate and novel ways to connect the dots in the future. So, thank you.